بصي انا عايز احط لنفسي صوره I think we can start now. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Dear colleagues, on behalf of all members and staff of our Department of Salmology, Suez Canal University in Egypt, I'm pleased to announce launching of our 32nd annual conference of our department. Uh, as all you know, Following long months of unprecedented lockdown um, because of uh, global COVID-19 crisis, this year we introduced our conference virtual. However, this year and for the first time, we have international guest speakers who will share us their talks, expertise, and discussions around updated hot topics in the retina. It is a pleasure and honor as well to welcome Professor Suji Kawa from Japan, Professor Remzi Avechi from Turkey, Mr. Nial Paton from UK, Mr. Ashad Jalil from UK, Mr. Mark Kospin from UK, Professor Ahmed Salam from USA. You all you all welcome to our department in Egypt and looking forward for more and more scientific collaboration. I would, like, I would like also to welcome our wonderful president of Egyptian Ophthalmological Society, Professor Dana Shauti. She is with us now and he will introduce her talk after a couple of minutes. I would like to welcome my colleagues in my department and our guest speakers from Egypt, Professor Mahmoud Ismail, the head and professor and the head of Ophthalmology Department, Al Azhar University. I welcome all my attendees, all our attendees now, and our conference. Uh, this conference will highlight the recent updates in ophthalmology with a special focus on the field of fecal refractive and bacterial segments. We hope you all will find our conference fruitful and knowledgeable as well. And we hope to take a time, good time with us through the upcoming two days, in addition to this day. Thank you very much. I uh, please, my colleagues, uh, let me now uh, introduce our wonderful president of Egyptian Somological Society, Professor Dala Shauki, to her to introduce her talk and sharing us launching of this conference. Please, Dr. Dalal, go on for that. Thank you so much for inviting me to introduce your uh, valuable Congress. And uh, I'm so happy to meet all of your guest speakers again, especially Dr. Ramzi, who uh, I met him a few months ago and uh, hoping to be repeated, inshallah, in the near future after the COVID has gone. Now, I am representing the Egyptian Ophthalmological Society uh, to launch the 32nd annual meeting of ophthalmology department in Suez Canal University. You are seeing my screen or not? My screen is, is yeah. already, okay? Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, this meeting is uh, under the patronage of Professor Ahmed Zaki, the president of Suez Canal University, Professor Osama Antar, the dean of faculty of medicine in Suez Canal University, and my dear friend, I call her the princess, Mervat El Shabrawi, head of the ophthalmology department. And all my dear colleagues in the department, and especially the ex president, Professor Dr. Sibai, who is working for me, with me too much in the society. Here, I'm just representing the photos of the ex, all ex-presidents of the society. These were from about 100 years or more since 1902. These are the photos of the old president since this is the first one. And this means the last one 
okay, and hoping to be extended. And during, uh, I want to just say some little things. During my uh, work in the society, we made many changes. American Academy session in the annual meeting, this started in March uh, 18. And then also an American Academy session in the annual meeting in March 19. Professor Dalel, huh? I'm sorry for interruption. All attendees ask you to open the full screen of your presentation. Please. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Better? <laughs> okay. Yes. And in the year 2020, this Congress is canceled two days before the start of the Congress because of this COVID attack in all over the world. Then during the academy session, we had uh, the general uh, uh, Dr. De, Mrs. Jane Aguirre, the responsible for the international affairs. She came and she introduced the American academy session. And also she made us many favors. They made us many favors as bringing us books as here is the celebration. They gave us gifts in the form of the books of the instruction courses, 10 uh, boxes. And we distributed them to all the universities. This was in the year 18. And then the year next year, we got another 10 boxes, also gift from the American Academy. This, I think this is the best achievement I could uh, uh, make to the society in addition to the American Academy session, because this is a good collaboration between one, uh, such a big society at the American Academy and our society. Also, here, just a minute. Oh. Here is one of the Congresses, I think the one, the last one in the year 19. This is how the attendees are occupying all the chairs and no empty spaces. We had also international speakers, about 42 speakers in the year uh, 19. We had such speakers in the canceled uh, Congress in the last year or this actual year. These are the speakers from the American Academy and Professor Theo Zeiler was among the speakers. And here in the gala dinner, the celebration and the gifts. Also, we could get an agreement with the Hellenic Society of Ophthalmology in Greece, uh, the HISWARS. The HISWARS, it is the Hellenic Society of Intraocular Implant and Refractive Surgery. And they made a session with us in the year 18, and then another one in the year 19. And we made an exchange, also some collaborators from Egypt, they went to them to chair their Congress. And here are the group of the Hellenic Society from Greece in Egypt. Here also gifts given to them, just a souvenir from Egypt. Here, Dr. Pandeli Papadopoulos and our colleagues in the society, Dr. Ahmed Abulanin and Professor Khaled Murad. Here also, Dr. Ibrahim El Adawi giving a gift to one of the Hellenic society. Then also we could get another agreement between us and the Tunisian Society of Ophthalmology and also from Najil Basar in Tunisia. And also they came and shared with us this uh, Professor Dr. Saleh Mahgoub and Omar Trabelsi from Tunisia and this Suad Faituri from Libya. Here we come to our colleagues, nice colleagues in Suez Canal University who are endorsing us, helping us and making a big chair in the uh, events of the Egyptian Ophthalmological Society. The last meeting, I want to tell that the last meeting of the Egyptian Ophthalmological Society was in Ismailia in conjunction with the Suez Canal University in 5 and 6 December in the year 19. 
just before the COVID. This was our last Congress. These are a group photo, but excuse me, because I brought all these photos from the Facebook just yesterday. So I couldn't bother you to get other photos. Here, one of the sessions in the Suez Canal, when they're had, they are having one of the doctor degrees uh, uh, examinations. Here also Dr. Uh, Mervat and colleagues, and also uh, Mohab, uh, Farid, Mohab Mamish, the president or the uh, one responsible for the Suez Canal arrangement and trips and everything like this. It was a very nice day. Here, my colleague, I put you his photo after exhaustion. I know I am always exhausting Professor Dr. Sebai, always helping. Every time we are making a board meeting, he is the first one to come. And I want to thank him so much for his great help. Here, his celebration, when he finished to be head of the department. Here also with Dr. Basuni, and here with Professor with uh, Farid Mohamed Mamish. When we speak about the Suez Canal University, we always have to remember our sincere colleague who passed. He passed, Doctor. I will tell you about one minute after the princess smile, after the smile of uh, Doctor Merva Chabrawi, and celebration of anniversary here of Doctor. Uh, one of the colleagues, Ahmed Mustafa, and here in uh, Shibin El Kum, I think, or uh, yes, it was with uh, one of the colleagues in another conference. And we always remember our colleague, Dr. Karim Kulkela. He was ex-president. His birthday, I remember always, is in the 26th of December, hoping him to be in heaven always. And please remember him and pray for him. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Dalal, for, uh, as usual, very talented talk, uh, very wonderful talk. Uh, you uh, never forget anyone to thank. Actually, we are all thanking you, all Egyptian society uh, members, thanking you for all your uh, continuous efforts and your scientific contribution to all scientific departments and all universities, Dr. Dalek. Thank really. You. Thank you very much. And uh, now uh, let me uh, introduce uh, our session today on retina. Uh, it's uh, actually my pleasure and honor to introduce our international guest speakers, uh, moderating the session by our uh, department son, son of our department, Dr. Abdullah Laban. He is a lecturer of ophthalmology in South Carolina University, Egypt. He is a consultant of veterinary surgery in Hull University in UK. And uh, actually, he uh, arranged for this meeting with his colleagues over the world. Uh, so we have Professor Akiteka uh, Sujikawa from University of Kutu University, Japan. Professor Suji Kawa is an experienced veteran surgeon. He has a special research interest on macular diseases and published over 300 articles in major ophthalmology journals. Uh, another uh, colleague, Professor Remzi Avecchi, is a founder of Retina Eye Hospital, Forsa, Turkey. Professor Avecchi has been invited as a surgeon to various life surgery meetings and as a guest speaker in international meetings, including American Academy of Pharmacology Speciality Day, Frankfurt Retina Meeting, and Florida Meeting. He has published many scientific articles in the field of pharmacology, and he is a member of many national and international pharmacology societies, including the club Jules Conan. Mr. Neil Patton, is a consultant vitro retinal surgeon at Manchester Royal Eye Hospital. He is a director of the International Vitro Retinal Fellowship. He has published over 80, 80 peer reviewed publications and authored chapters in ophthalmic textbooks. His research interests 
encompass all aspects of veterinary surgery, and he served on the editorial board of the journal I. Mr. Asad Jalil is a consultant veterinary surgeon and you write especially at Manchester Royal Eye Hospital, one of the leading ophthalmic units of Europe and a center of, for clinical and research excellence. Mr. Jalil is an integral part of the research team at Manchester Royal Eye Hospital, which has pioneered research into, amongst others, retinal implants and retinal gene therapy. Very updated topic, Mr. Asad Jalil. You're welcome to our university. He has co-authored CPOC chapters in addition to more than 35 publications in peer-reviewed ophthalmic journals. Mr. Mark Costin is a consultant veterinary surgeon and he is a veterinary led at Hull University Teaching Hospital in UK. He is clinical lead for the ophthalmology department and he has a special interest in small coach veterinary surgery and the complex diabetic retinopathy. Professor Ahmed Salam, Professor in Retina and Uveitis, Director of the Residency Program and Director of Uveitis Service at the University of Arkansas for Medical Science. Uh, you all welcome to our annual conference from our department in Egypt. Uh, it will not be the last one, it will be the start and I think we will cooperate more and more, inshallah, in upcoming years for more collaborative scientific work. Okay, let uh, my colleague, Dr. Abdallah, to start your session and uh, say goodbye now and let him with all attendees. Assalamu alaikum. Dr. Abdallah. Many thanks, Dr. Mehmet, for this nice introduction and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thankfully, we are starting on time and we'll start with the first speaker, Professor Tsujikawa. Professor Tsujikawa is the chairman of Kyoto University Ophthalmology Department. He's actually my ex-mentor and he has a special interest in research, particularly macular disease and circulatory macular di uh, disturbance. He will present us today on recent advancement on the understanding of retinal vein occlusion. So, Professor Tsuchikawa, please go ahead. Thank you, Ab uh, Abdara. Uh, it's my great honor to be invited to such a prestigious meeting. So, I will start my talk. Um, so, can you share your presentation now? So, yeah, we see it and please put it on full screen. Excellent. Thank you, Abdara. Today, I'd like to discuss my recent work related to imaging analysis of retinal vein occlusion. I'd like to begin by talking about OCT analysis of retinal veins and capillaries. Today, OCT is widely used in the study of chorioretinal disease and has replaced fluorescent angiography in clinical practice. It is well known that BRBO is caused by the focal occlusion of the major retinal vein at the venous uh, arterial venous crossing. The major artery and vein share common adventure cysts at the crossing, and the mechanical compression of the rigid arterial wall is the probable cause of the narrowing of the venous room. Around three to four decades ago, it was reported that BLBO occur only at arterial overcrossing site. However, we speculate this was probably not true. OCTA is useful in the analysis of overcrossing. Uh, can you increase the voice? This is a case of BLBO that is caused at the AB crossing. In the fundus photo or even in the FA, this artery seemed to run over the vein at this crossing. We applied OCTA in this case. The left OCT image clearly shows this vein actually ran over the artery at this crossing. The image on the right is the cross-sectional OCT image along the green dot line. From this section, we can confirm that 
This is the case of BRBO occurring at the various overcrossing sites. So we studied 33 eyes with acute BRBO using OCTA to study the AB configuration at the affected crossing. In the current study, BRBO was classified as arterial overcrossing type in 21 eyes and as venous overcrossing type in 20 eyes. We could confirm uh, that venous overcrossing type BRBO was more common than previously reported. Additionally, the remaining two eyes were classified as helical overcrossing type. Based on the previous OCT study, we speculated that pattern of the BRBO may be associated with the venous narrowing at the affected crossing. Left panel represents a case of arterial overcrossing type. Venous lumen diameter at the crossing site seemed to be relatively preserved. The right panel is a case of the venous overcrossing type. Venous lumen diameter at the crossing site was extremely narrow. Next, we examine the association between the crossing pattern and retinal non-perfusion area. The upper image is a case of arterial overcrossing BRBO, while lower is of the venous overcrossing type. As shown in this slide, the arterial overcrossing BRBO have a minimal non-perfusion area compared to the extensive non-perfusion area of venous overcrossing BRBOs. This slide summarizes the baseline data of the patient with BRBO. In our patient, affected crossing pattern was approximately 50-50. Venous overcrossing BRBOs demonstrate significant venous narrowing at the crossing site and larger non-perfusion areas. Furthermore, during the four period, only venous overcrossing BRBOs developed neovascularization. Most patients show the progression of the retinal no perfusion area. As shown in this case, the progression of a non perfusion area is often accompanied by a significantly arterial narrowing. We speculated that the decrease in retinal arterial supply may contribute to the formation of non perfusion area. Eyes that are affected with BRBO tend to show an extension of the non perfusion area depending on the time. However, as shown in this case, some eyes show the reperfusion within the non perfusion area too. I will summarize this part. The OCT shows a, a report, uh, repeated examination of the retinal perfusion states. Venous overcrossing BRBOs are more common than expected and have venous narrowing at the affected crossing site and the large non perfusion area. Venous overcrossing BRBOs may represent a risk of neovascularization. I will begin a discussion on OCT analysis of the macular capillaries. OCTA has various merits, especially because OCTA allows us to study retinal capillary plexus in the desired layer by segmentation. These images have been obtained from the case of acute BRBO. The left image shows a tiny change in the superficial retinal capillary plexus. However, as seen in the right image, Capillary change are more prominent in the deep capillary plexus. Each capillary unit is clearly seen in affected upper hemisphere, but it is disorganized in the affected area. To evaluate the macular capillaries, we usually use two segmentations, which are superficial and deep capillary plexuses. However, as described in the classical paper of history. Human retinal capillary formed four layers in peripapillary area, 
and three layers around the phobia. This is a 3D data set of normal human macula. You will find numerous white dots derived from capillary, forming four capillary layers. The first layer is in the nerve fire layer, second is in the ganglion cell layer, and third and fourth are seen at the upper and the lower part of the inner nuclear layer. We made the pre a precise segmentation of each layer. The first layer is in the uh, I, uh, MFL, which is known as the labial peripatellar capillary, and forms the U shape in the macular area. RPC is more clearly visualized in this area and in peripatellar area. We can confirm that RPC comes from the optic disc and has limited connection with major retinal vessels. The left OCT image is of the commonly used superficial capillary plexuses. The right OCT image are of the NFL and GCL. The commonly used superficial capillary plexus contain RPC and the second capillary layer in GCL. This OCT image shows that the second capillary layer in GCL has a capillary free zone along the artery walls. This slide shows the second capillary layer in GCL. The light magnified image of the dotted area shows that the capillary in the GCL forms lobular artery or capillary venous venule unit. In each unit, blood flows from the surrounding arteries. After, after circulating in this unit, blood is drained through the central venules. The bottom OCT image shows the upper and the lower part of the INA. Fobial capillary ring is clearly detected in the third capillary layer in the upper INA. Vortex-like capillary units are more prominent in the fourth capillary layer in the lower INL. You can confirm that vortex-like capillary units are connected to the second and third capillary layer with the connecting vessels. This is an OCT image of the eye suffering from BRBO. From the detail observation of OCTA, we found that non perfusion area are initially formed around the arterioles and usually extend toward the venues. OCT does not need dye. The repeated OCT examination can be carried out as contributed confirmation this fine. Now, anti bridge therapy is a standard treatment for macular edema secondary to BRBO. Various OCT analysis have been performed to predict the treatment efficacy. Recently, Hasegawa reported the patient with BRBO with a significant macular vessel reduction after initial injection of ranimizumab have a lower chance of recurrence. In 1990s, Pinkelstein reported the concept of ischemic macular edema, which has good visual prognosis. OCT findings may explain the concept of ischemic macular edema. This slide shows another application of OCT analysis for evaluating the treatment efficacy of the anti bridge therapy for macular edema. Capillary dilation in the temporal macular area is often observed before the recurrence of macular edema. Make it is, is a good predictor of the recurrence of macular edema and the large number of injections. I'd like to summarize this section. OCT allows us to study the retinal capillary plexus in the desired radar by segmentation. Capillary change in BRBO are more prominent in deep capillary plexus compared to the superficial capillary plexus. An OCT analysis of the uh, macular capillaries may help, help predict the efficacy of the anti-BGF therapy. 
Finally, I will discuss the application of adaptive optics for the evaluation of uh, retinal circulation of VRBO. Adaptive optics was originally developed for the correcting uh, atmospheric fluctuation, which can obscure uh, astronomical observation. AOSO is an imaging modality that enables visualization of the retinal microstructure at the cellular level. AOSO has been used to visualize various retinal structures, such as the nerve fiber bundle, photoreceptor cells, circulating blood cells, and blood vessel uh, uh, walls. We have previously reported the application of AOSLO for evaluating the integrity of the cone cells after the treatment macular edema associated with BRVO. This patient achieved visual acuity of 1.0 in the left eye. OCT showed the recovery of the ellipsoid zone at the phobia. However, AOSLO clearly showed irregular loss of cone cells around the phobia. AOSLO has been used to analyze the wall of the major retinal vessels. This slide clearly shows the walls of the temporal arcade veins. Patients with hypertension often show the thickened arterial walls and increased wall to lumen ratio. To obtain greater image contrast with AOSLO, recently, the offset pinhole system was developed. Here is the shown of the uh, offset pinhole principle. Compared to the focal LSO, offset pinhole LSO can improve the retinal image contrast by blocking the reflection from the retinal nerve fiber layers. Offset pinhole LSO can be used to visualize various retinal structures. This slide shows hard state in an eyes with a BRBO. In the color found the photograph, hard state are seen as yellow sticky materials. However, AOSLO clearly showed hard state as gathered spherical deposit in the retina, similar to pathological images. Recently, we applied offset pinhole AOSLO to microaneurysms. This slide shows the case of chronic BRBO. The center image shows a highly magnified OCTA scan. The right image shows an offset pinhole AOSLO scan. We can see real time blood flow at the red, cell, uh, red blood cell level. High resolution and image contrast produced by the offset pinhole system contribute to visualization of the vessel uh, wall microstructure of microaneurysms in the living human eye. AOSLO clearly de uh, demonstrates various MAs. The black arrow indicates cap, the cap structures, and the blue thick arrows show turbulent blood flow. Some MAs have a thick wall-like cap structure, and each of these MAs has a different degree of interaneurysmal turbulence. Previous reports divided the morphology of MAs into four types, structural, first form, and focal bias, and mixed. In our study, structural MAs were more prevalent type. The cap structure was present in 52% of MAs. The size of MAs with cap structure was larger than that of MAs without the cap structure. In Fanda's photograph of uh, OCT image, all MAs seem to be similar, but AOSLO uh, reveals that MAs had similar morphological types. This slide shows the dilated capillary in an eye with a BRBO. Lower panel shows AOSLO image 
of the parafoveal capillary depicted in the upper OCTA images. Even OCTA shows marked dilation uh, of the parafoveal capillaries. As I mentioned earlier, this is a sign of recurrence of macular edema. White arrowheads indicate the unusual wall structures of the dilated capillaries. The lumen of the uh, dilated capillaries is approximately 20 micrometer wide, which is threefold greater than that of the physiological capillaries. I'll discuss today detailed observation with novel uh, imaging modalities contribute to our understanding of the pathophysiology of DRBO. I believe further observation of extensive area with OCTA may elicit capillary dropouts caused by BRBO. Thank you for your attention and time. Thank you very much, Professor Tsujikawa, for this interesting uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. I have a quick question for you. Oh, thank you. I have a quick question for you. So, uh, uh, how do you, do you deal differently when you find arteriovenous overcrossing? from those who have arteriovenous undercrossing. Do you deal differently uh, with these patients? Uh, we can easily, uh, uh, previously we used OCT B-scan to detect, uh, to uh, classify the BRBO type. Now we usually use OCTA. OCT is more easy to detect two types. You can try. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And do you deal differently in terms of management? So if there is a macular edema associated with arterial overcrossing, or do you deal with it differently if there is undercrossing? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, the crossing type is related to the uh, non-perfusion area, not to the macular edema. If we find macular edema in either type, uh, we usually use uh, antibiotic treatment. Yeah. I wonder if anyone has a question to Professor Tsujikawa. Thank you. <laughs> I have one more question. Uh -huh. For those with, when you, with cases with central retinal vein occlusion with, where they present with significant uh, peripheral ischemia, what do you do in these cases? Do you treat with laser or places do anti-VGF? And nowadays, we sometimes use anti-VGF therapy, but, but, but in Japan, we recommend to the um, laser palm retinal photocoagulation to prevent the uh, neovascularization. It is important to initially prevent the neovascularization. And if the patient has a relatively good visual acuity, we can uh, try to re rescue the macular edema. Okay, thank you very much. Thank yeah. you, much appreciated. Thank so you. brilliant. Thank you. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Ahmed Salam. He's a professor of retina and uveitis, and he's actually my ex-mentor. He's the director of uh, residency program and also director of uveitis surface at University of Arkansas, USA. So welcome, Dr. Salam, and please can you share your presentation? Oh, you are muted. You are muted. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Abdallah um, and Dr. Merville for the kind inv invitation. And I'm really delighted to be here with friends and colleagues from all, all over the world. Uh, I'm sorry that I give this presentation earlier because of uh, emergency cases we had to put today. So my talk is on vitreoretinal surgery and uveitis, and I'll touch a little bit on the what's update, uh, what's, what is the update uh, in uveitis uh, treatment in terms of local treatment. So I have no financial interest. Uh, so when we come about, we, when we come to discuss vitreoretinal surgery and uveitis, uh, we can classify it into diagnostic vitrectomy and therapeutic uh, vitrectomy or vitreous procedures. Uh, for diagnostic vitrectomy, sometimes you just need to eyeball what's happening in the vitreous. You have a patient really with dense new inflammation. You're not really sure what's happening. You don't know which way to go. And the information you're getting from the B scan and from the history is not enough. 
uh, or you suck again so this might not be enough just clearing the vitreous opacity and eyeballing it uh, you may want to take a vitreous biopsy or chorioretinal biopsy so this is a case actually a patient who had new uveitis 3d and we did not know what's going on with her and uh, when we started removing the vitreous and her and having a look it looked like more like small peripheral infiltrates and then with indentation uh, she had uh, significant snow banking and it didn't look like retinitis to us and the patient was put on systemic steroid and later on immunosuppression and did well but initially there was no view severe posterior synechia and the patient history was very poor and we didn't know which way to go then another scenario is you have a patient again with uh, uh, significant inflammation, significant vitritis, maybe uh, some chorioretinal lesions, and you're suspecting lymphoma, or again, you're not sure whether there's infection or inflammation in your plastic. And if you're not sure and the differential diagnosis is why, then a vitreous biopsy rather than a vitreous step would be indicated. I just want to show here, especially the young colleagues, something important with the vitreous biopsy is to do it under air. You get a huge sample under air and the globe does not collapse. And that's how you do it. You switch the infusion to air and that will dry up the infusion. If you can skip priming, fine, but some machines, when you try to skip priming, it just doesn't work. And then you can connect also the, in, the air to the cutter to dry it up. And then you're in business after that because you've dried up the system. And then you reconnect your things here. These are the syringes connected. So the uh, uh, sample does not go to the, to the cassette and manually aspiration as you cut. And then we can take like three syringes and, and send for infection, uh, bacteria and fungal, viral and toxo PCR, and also for lymphoma. And that's how it looks like from the outside. So the air will be coming and you'll be cutting under the air. So again, you start cutting and the air will be coming and you go deeper and you can get really up to two mil of neat vitreous this way. Then when you're done with the biopsy, then you switch to the infusion. So infusion under air prevents globe collapse and gets you a very good sample. And sometimes you really need to go for a chorioretinal biopsy. And this patient had a very widespread uh, chorioretinitis that completely wiped off this eye. And the reason was we wanted to know what's happening for the other eye implication. And that ended up being uh, a very unusual uh, um, widespread toxoplasma retinitis. And his only risk factor was that he was old. Really. He was not immunosuppressed, which is uh, uh, very unusual. And uh, the problem is usually getting the sample out. So you can uh, drop it several times. So the trick is to make a wide opening when you're pulling it out. And that's another patient here with lesions that were lumpy and hemorrhages and uh, he had detachment under oil and so was fixed elsewhere. And then his lesions really ended up being a lymphoma lesions and he had B cell lymphoma, as you can see here with the immunohistochemistry stains and large um, uh, cells. Right, so that's for the diagnostic indication. You don't need it in many cases. In uh, many cases, you make the diagnosis based on clinical examination and most likely what it would be. But when the differential diagnosis is big, particularly if you're concerned about lymphoma, then that's really what uh, uh, vitreous biopsy under air is helpful. Okay, now talking about the therapeutic uses, we'll go under inflammation and complication and as also a sustained drug release. Uh, so inflammation, the question is, uh, in infectious uveitis and ophthalmitis, is it injections or vitrectomy first? And then they use a non infectious uh, uveitis, and then they use a retained lens fragment inflammation. Complications including vitreous opacity, epiretinal membrane, retinal detachment, and hypotony, and sustained drug release. So for endophthalmitis, Yes, you can do vitrectomy when this patient comes, but remember every hour is counted and you want to get this eye sterile as much as, uh, as quick as you can. So the endophthalmitis vitrectomy study uh, results are still valid. And we found this in recent uh, <clears throat> data from a retrospective, two retrospective study from the European Vitretinal Society uh, members that we found actually there is an increased indication for vitrectomy as an initial treatment for endophthalmitis. 
and most of like 75% of cases are sorted this way. But when you look at the results, there's no difference. So the end of the vitrectomy study results are still valid. So the advisory is try to inject these eyes within one hour of presentation. Then after that, if you want to be considering vitrectomy, if they are not improving, that's how to where to go. But delaying vitrectomy until you're ready for the setup, even in the best center, is not really uh, good because you will be delaying it for at least a few hours until you're ready for the surgery. And vitrectomy for endothelitis is risky. So whether you induce hyaloid separation or not, that's a matter of judgment, advantages and disadvantages. The retina is so friable. Uh, advantages that you decrease the infection load, but the retina is so friable. Uh, and again, the other uh, point to consider whether you shave the periphery or not. I wouldn't advise shaving the periphery, except in very selected cases, uh, because there's also risk of retinal breaks. And retinal breaks in this context usually will end up with uh, a detachment that is difficult to repair. So I would say be conservative with the uh, uh, with the vitrectomy for um, endo endophthalmitis. Uh, what about fungal endophthalmitis and the role of vitrectomy? And this is a patient with candida endophthalmitis. So we found the same as well. We found actually that vitrectomy uh, as treatment of infection, it does decrease the uh, late um, onset retinal detachment and also the need for uh, another vitrectomy, but it does not affect the visual outcome. And other groups found that as well. So again, I think the message really is get on with treatment. Fungal endothelitis patients might be a different ball game because these patients, especially IVDU patients, intravenous drug use may not come back. So you may want to do everything. But I think the, the main treatment is to treat the systemic treatment, intravitreal if you're more than a flat chorioretinitis, and, um, and then consider a vitrectomy. Uh, and this is a patient had this big fungal uh, lesion here, and that was after treatment. And we managed to dissect this off the disc and then bring it forward and send it for histopathology and showed with uh, candida lesion with gem sustain. And this patient did fantastically well. Right, so what, uh, this is very important. Can, can vitrectomy decrease inflammation? So you have patients with, for example, I mean, most uh, discussed with intermediate uveitis. So can vitrectomy just decrease intermediate uveitis and decrease the need of medications? The answer really from uh, several study is no, or we cannot tell. I mean, there are certain groups, uh, Dr. Foster group, for example, believe that it actually decreases the inflammation load and the treatment, but we don't see this. And in a recent review article said that mentioned that they really cannot conclude that. It's yes, it's useful for complications of uveitis like epiretinal membrane, but you cannot conclude this, that it decreases the treatment load. Uh, okay, then next is retain lens fragment and just for anti sigmund surgeons re-watching really us. Uh, the important thing always is to remove lens matter. Here in this case, you think there's not too much lens matter, but actually there is much. And that's the reason why patients with drop nuclei or PC tear have inflamed eyes, uh, because there are lots of lens matter left behind. So always make a good cleaning of the anterior segment and also the posterior segment. You search the retina for breaks, but also for uh, inferior lens matter uh, especially if the case was not done on the day or next day, you may find inferior lens matter in the pars plana area. And vitreous opacity is a well-known complication of, uh, of uh, uh, uveitis, and that's a good indication for vitrectomy, and it's usually so troublesome. Just be wary, these eyes are young eyes, and uh, the hyaloid will be intact, so just be wary of this. Even epiretinal membrane in the context of uveitis uh, can be uh, tricky in terms of significant attachment to the retina. So just be wary about that. And, um, and also the outcome, they tend to do well. And I think uh, Mr. Uh, Pat, uh, Niall Patton from Manchester, they published a paper on that, on the outcome of uh, uveitic epiretinal membranes after surgery. But it's, uh, it's, it's different from a primary epiretinal membrane in terms of the outcome. Um, okay, and then retinal detachment. Retinal detachment in the context of uveitis can be challenging. 
most of the breaks usually happen at the edge of the scars and they're usually very small breaks and difficult to find. So just be wary of that. Uh, you, they can, if you find a break and for sure, and there's no PVR, they can really be uh, managed with gas. Uh, this case was after a toxplasma retinitis, I, then in an immunosuppressed patient and was managed with oil. Uh, this is another case here after ARN, and we could not really find a break uh, in this patient. That's after healing ARN. Uh, and I looked everywhere. I even put subretinal blue dye to try to look for a color Schlieren, but I couldn't find a break. So I ended up doing a uh, drainage retinotomy uh, and uh, 360 laser NGAS. And this patient did so well. But uh, that was, um, we could not find a break. Hypotony, really hypotony in uveitis is the end of the game. This is a patient who had uh, cataract extraction, uveitic, then so many injections to try to build up the pressure, ended up in severe hypotony. Then we thought, okay, well, let's do a vitrectomy and silicone oil. Uh, and that's her vitrectomy here. And interestingly, she had an eluvin implant that shot back through the infusion cannula during the vitrectomy, so small, it shot back and then back again in the eye. But I can see, show you here what happened with her pressure. Pressure was low, then had the surgery with the silicone oil, a bit of going up with the pressure, but then low again. So really, it does not help filling the eye with oil. And in many cases, the oil comes forward because there's no echoes to keep it. So I think in my view, unless it's really very recent and there's a a uh, definite cyclotic membrane you can peel off. Hypotony and uveitis is the end of the game. I'm uh, coming to the end of my presentation here. So the last thing is to use it as a sustained drug release, the vitreous cavity for uh, medication. Cyrolimus is a medication in a way similar to mesotrexate and maybe coming, still did not meet the FDA approvals. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it has a unique side effect that it causes vitreous opacities and a uh, cataract similar to the silicon oil cataract with posterior capsular opacification. Uh, uh, and you can use other implants, as we said, dexamethasone implant, and we just published on that in uveitic eyes, and it helps really quite in the eye uh, with in uveitic patients. Uh, last is Retisert, and it's a, a fantastic treatment, but very high rate of intraocular pressure, and we use that alone or in vitrectomy in severe uveitis cases. Uh, last thing is suprachoroidal root, and uh, the P3 study met its uh, endpoints with the suprachoroidal injections of 4 milligram trimethylone, uh, leading to improvement of vision and sustained release and only 11% pressure rise, which you'd expect 50% was intravitreal root. But still, that's not in practice, and these needles are difficult to get, one millimeter needle to inject in suprachoroidal space. I think that's interesting. It's not without a risk, but it's interesting that the uh, medication is hidden away from the trabecular meshwork to decrease the risk of pressure rise. Well, thank you so much. That's a summary of what's happening with uveitis. And I think um, if I can leave you with something, especially for young fellows as vitreous biopsy under air, and also in post-cataric endophthalmitis, I would get on and get this iced injection within an hour, then later on deal with the, uh, if you want to be considering vitrectomy. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Salam, for this interesting presentation. I have one quick question for yourself, especially in the treatment of intermediate uveitis. Do you have like a step to protocol? Do you have a plan when you decide to do which cases will need so, That's a great question. So many cases do not need treatment. So if there's no really complication, namely cystoid macular edema or significant vitreous opacification or papillitis, then many cases do not need treatment. You only treat the anterior segment inflammation if there is. Then if there are one of these problems, then uh, I would go really, uh, you can do posterior subtenor orbital floor, especially if it's more one eye, uh, and then you can do intravitreous steroids, that's one route, or you can go systemic. Uh, if you go systemic, then uh, most likely they will need a second line immunosuppressive treatment. Uh, if they are not, um, controlled on five milligram prednisone. That's for adults. And in children, we definitely go second line immunosuppressives and try to stop the steroids. But I think the message maybe if you go systemic treatment 
always keep the steroids five milligram or less because they get lots and lots of side effects. Yeah, thank you. I have thank one question from the audience. It's related to when to start injection of antibiotics or vitrectomy in patients with endosalmitis. Is visual activity is a factor? Uh, um, I, I think the end. Oh, we lost him. <laughs> Yeah, I guess we lost uh, Dr. Salam. I'm not sure. Okay, brilliant. So uh, then we move to the next speaker. It's Mr. Jalil. So Mr. Jalil is a consultant veterinary surgeon and uveitis specialist as well in Manchester Eye Hospital, which is actually one of the leading units in Europe and the UK. Mr. Jalil is an integral part of the uh, research team at Manchester and with his colleagues they started gene therapy treatment in the UK and Mr. Jalil will kindly uh, tell us about his experience with gene therapy. His presentation title is Has Gene Therapy Finally Arrived? Welcome Asad. Thank you Bula. Um, thank you for um, giving me this forum to just share my experience. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes. Can you share your presentation, please, just to make sure it's sharing nicely. Can you, can you see it? Yeah, yeah. And can you please put it on the uh, play button? Yeah. It should be now. It should be shared. Right. Yeah. Can you put it on the presentation views now? Cool to Yeah, Yeah, just slideshow, yeah. Right. Hello, everybody. Um, it's Asad uh, Jalil from Manchester. So I'm going to actually talk about um, retinal gene therapy. This was first licensed by the FDA in 2017, but it was pretty much two years later when it started getting more traction. And the only disease right now for which gene therapy is licensed in various countries is RPE65 mutation. So I'm going to talk about gene therapy in general, but the focus is on RP65 mutation. Now, inherited retinal dystrophies are caused by mutations in more than 260 genes, one of which is RP65, which is critical um, for visual cycle. Lack of RP65 causes severe defi deficiency in rhodopsin with death of photoreceptor cells. Now there's progressive vision loss, Primarily, it's a rod-mediated disease, so you lose the rod function first, but in advanced cases, the cones get affected and there can be near total blindness. And there are two main phenotypes of RPE65. One is labor's congenital amaurosis, and the other is retinitis pigmentosa. And both of them are, you know, we all know about this, that they are, clearly have a very different uh, clinical presentation in family history. Labor's starts early, it's early infantile rod cone dystrophy and it's very severe. And it's considered to have a much worse prognosis than other dystrophies. It affects two, um, two to three per 100,000. And mutations in labors affect, in RP65, account for six to 16% of labors diagnosis. Retinitis pigmentosa accounts for half of inherited retinal dystrophies with a much higher prevalence of 20 to 30 per 100,000. And again, mutations in RP65 account for 2% of RP. So roughly 10% of labors and 2% of RP patients will have this mutation. So it's a very uncommon um, condition. Um, RP in this context manifests in late childhood or early adulthood. Previously, there were no licensed treatments and it was, the treatment was all supportive, which is low vision aids, social and educational support and genetic counseling. Now, what is gene therapy? It is a process by which new DNA is inserted into, a cell, into cells. And the aim is to actually replace a faulty gene, which is not functioning. The genes are normally injected on top of a vector and it's generally a viral vector. In, you know, in the era of COVID where we're all scared of viruses, viruses can actually act as vectors. And you know, in, in this context, we, they transport the gene. Why is retina a good target for gene therapy? 
The eye is formed of ordered epithelial layers. You can easily access retina through pass planar vitrectomy. The amount of retinal tissue is pretty small. Then we have the blood retinal barrier, which prevents immune response. And it's relatively easy to monitor the efficacy of gene therapy treatment by various tests. These are the various vectors, but primarily the viral vector, which is involved in most of the gene therapy treatment is AAV, which is adeno-associated virus. So the first treatment, which was appro approved by the FDA was Varatigine Naparvovac, it's Luxterna, and that's primarily RP65 mutation where it's used. It's administered at the end of vitrectomy as a subretinal injection using a one-off dose of 1.5 into 10 to the power 11 vector genome. So it's a 0.3 mil of drug which is injected under the retina. And in order to further dampen the immune response, patient is given perioperative steroids. They started three days before to two weeks after. So the treatment was approved by FDA at the end of 2017. A year later, it was approved in Europe, and then it was approved by NICE, which is the main regulatory body in UK in September 2019. Now you can see the, this is the shelf price of the drug. It is about 600,000 pounds for, for 0.3 mil. It's, it's pretty expensive as you can see. And the license of the drug is, according to the company, it was its license to be given into one eye and then the other eye at least around two weeks later. That's where the trials were done and we'll come to the trials now. The phase one study on this was primarily done in University of Pennsylvania and University of Iowa in US. There were two, cent uh, two centers. It was a study, a single arm study, which was primarily looking at the safety of the drug, dose escalating study started in 2012, 13. And there were patients with RP65 mutation. Primary endpoint was basically uh, adverse events and with all the secondary endpoints. And you can see, look at the numbers. The numbers aren't great. There was only 12 patients in the original study. And this led to a phase three study, which was an open label RCT. Um, this was again done in primarily those two US centers, but UK and Europe were also involved. The age was four to 44 years. This was a crossover study. So the patients who were in the control arm were eligible for Luxterna treatment uh, at around 12 months. And the primary endpoint was taken at a year. So the original intervention was done in 21 patients with 10 patients as the control group. And at a year, these 10 patients were also offered uh, the surgery. What are the tests? Now, you have to see that this is a rod mediated disease and a rod mediated improvement. So vision isn't a great marker for looking at that. The two main tests which were basically analyzed and which give a better marker of rod function in retina one is multi-luminance mobility test. So this is a functional assessment of vision in dim illumination. There's a video of that as well, um, which I have, but there's not enough time to share, where patients are given a navigational route in different levels of illumination. And the second major test is full field scotopic threshold or full field light sensitivity test, which is an electrodiagnostic test which measures the sensitivity of the retina. And then the two other markers were vision and visual fields. So the phase three study, uh, the, the conclusion was that there was a statistically significant improvement in the navigational vision, which was given by this MLMT score, multi-luminance mobility testing. And by three years, 60% of the original patients were able to pass this test at the lowest light levels. Um, and 90% of those where the, where the treatment was given a year later. Visual acuity, basically, there was not much of a difference, um, which, is, which is what you really want. You don't want to do a treatment and inject a drug which is working on rods, but it causes a harmful effect on the cone function. So there was no statistically significant change in the visions between injected and uninjected patients. Goldman Fields and Humphreys Fields showed improvement, uh, which was again statistically significant, and this is what you would expect with rod function which improves after the disease. So NICE approved this in September 2000 and, um, 2019. 
And once NICE approves in UK, this, the way our system works is we're given three months for us to start this treatment. And three centers were selected. One was Oxford, where a lot of research and gene therapy is done. The other was Moorfields, and the third was Manchester. Now, why Manchester? One, we, I would like to think we have a pretty comprehensive rectal unit where we all have, uh, we cover all the clinical bases and sort of research bases. One of my colleagues is currently involved in gene therapy for AMD. One of my colleagues, Niall, who will probably speak later, is involved in research with stem cell transplant. I inherited this from my, one of my colleagues who's left now, who is working on inherited retinal diseases. So plus Manchester has a pretty strong genetic department, pediatric department. So it was, you know, in a way we were covering all the bases. So we were one of the three centers where Lux Turner treatment was offered on the NHS. So what are the criteria for treatment? More, the most important thing is we, patients obviously need to have a biallelic RP65 mutation. This means that any patient now with retinitis pigmentosa or labors should have genetic testing done because 10% of labors and 2% of RP patients will have treatment. And that's this. There are three criteria to look out for. It's not vision. We need to have a viable retina. So OCT should be more than 100 microns in the central macula. There should be three or more disc areas without atrophy or pigmentary degeneration within posterior pole. And there should be some degree of visual field present within 30 degrees of fixation. So Manchester, a multidisciplinary team was set up. Um, it's led by our clinical director. It involves VR surgeons, pediatric ophthalmologists, geneticists, electrophysiologists, imaging people, pharmacy and nursing. So, now I'm going to give you a bit of my experience of the four eyes we've done till now. Frankly, when the treatment came, I was a little skeptical because it's a very expensive treatment. The original study only had in total phase one and phase one, two and phase three studies had about 43 eyes. So I'll exactly tell you what's happened to our patients and then um, you guys can make up your own mind. So to date, we've done four eyes two eyes of an adult patient and two, two children. The first case is what I'm going to present. It was a 39 year old with RP and RP65 mutation. Vision was 0.6 log mass, 6, 24 in one eye and 648 in the other eye. No color vision, no ERGs, multifocal ERGs were non-recordable. And FST, which is the marker of rod function, cold field stimulate, you know, light sensitivity was minimal, minus 2.2. These are the markers of uh, basically retinal sensitivity and low illumination. This is uh, the clinical picture, nothing really, you know, the typical RP picture with perivascular pigment. Uh, you can see that the, I'm not showing the OCT, but there was enough retinal thickness and there is not much atrophy or pigmentation in the central macula. So the vitrectomy was pretty straightforward. PVD induction was easy. Um, using a 38, 25 gauge vitrectomy, 38 gauge cannula, 0.3 mils is a lot of volume, actually, if you think about it. Normally, we inject 0.1 mils for other indications. So it's a pretty massive bleb, uh, which I've made. Um, and then search. And with this bleb, normally, you would leave it under fluid and not put any tamponade in. Because if you put air or gas in with so much fluid under the macula, there's a high risk of fold. But the recommendation for now is that you leave it under air. The reason being that the virus capsids are in the vitreous and you have to wash them out. So the more capsids there are, the more there'll be immune response later on. But we have basically said to the, to the research guys that maybe it's an idea to go to air, wash out all the, all the viral capsids and then go back to fluid to reduce the risk of macular fold. Anyways, that's just a bit of technical thing. Um, so this is the left eye first. Two weeks post-surgery, there was CMO. And four weeks later, there was a bit more. Now, CMO in context of gene therapy is really important because it indicates immune, immune response against the gene. There isn't much anterior uveitis and vitritis seen, but if macular edema is there, it's generally you know, considered to be against the gene you've injected. Now, at four weeks, the patient had the other eye done, so was given oral steroids. And I'll tell you why the patient was um, given, uh, had the other eye done four weeks later, although that wasn't the plan. Anyways, um, six, three months later and six months later, fovea is completely normal. There's good ellipsoid layer. 
and there was very good functional outcome in this eye. Now, the other eye was actually meant to be done six months later. As you can, you know, you, you see how in, things work out in practice. Six weeks later, we were meant to do a kid. We had ordered the drug, the drug had arrived, and then the kid develops respiratory tract infection and the anesthetists aren't happy. Now we had about a window of five days and this is a drug worth, you know, on shelf price is 600,000 pounds. This guy was extremely happy at that point with the left eye. So we had two other patients lined up and the drug company's license was, and actually that's how many people do in US, they give do the other eye two weeks later. So we decided to do the other eye four weeks later. Very similar response, macular edema two weeks later, patient given a bit of extended course of steroids. Macular edema goes, but in the other eye, the ellipsoid layer is, is gone in the center. So let's go to the results because he was followed up pretty closely. Left eye is the eye which we did first. Vision actually went up in the left eye. 0.8 went up to 0.7, not much of a difference, but it didn't drop. The right eye's vision, which was actually the better eye, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 logma, dropped to 1.2 logma, which is pretty consistent with the OCT. The OCT showed loss of ellipsoid in the center. What is interesting is that there was very clear objective improvement of increase in rod function. Um, he was extremely happy that although he felt he could just not see as clearly in the center in the right eye, he was navigating more, he was more independent, he was less reliable, but again, you, you know, there may be a bit of a placebo effect. He was happy that he's received a drug worth whatever. But we actually then carried out um, Goldman Fields, which showed improvement. And the most important thing here was the FST, which is retinal sensitivity. Now, this was done by uh, Neil Parry, who's a fantastic, you know, electrodiagnostic consultant here, who's very, very independent and also very skeptical about, like, about this, like me. He basically sent this slide which is, and it's very clear that the retinal sensitivity had improved in low illumination by a factor of 10 in the right eye and by a factor of 16 in the left eye. So whatever we've done, which was, you know, it improved the rod function. In the left eye, the cone function marginally improved. In the right eye, the cone function reduced. And why it happened? It could be an immune response. It could be just the mechanical effect of four-wheel detachment. It could be just the effect of the drug. So the first question is, what is the ideal timing for surgery? A drug company, which is Novartis, are very keen to have the other eye done two weeks later. At Manchester, we decided we will wait three to six months. Um, whether that leads to an increased immune response, who knows? This, you know, nobody has any data on that. Is air tamponade really needed for these injections? Um, probably not. And actually, theoretically, it would make more of a sense to leave the eye under fluid. The other trials which are being done, we are leaving the eye under fluid. There was juxtafoveal macular edema, which was responsive to oral steroids. And they, you know, there can be effects in the central vision, which is ellipsoid zone disruption. So it may be an idea, because we're working on rods, to maybe not detach the fovea and just inject it in the, you know, around the fovea. However, we have to follow, as things stand, we have to follow what was done in the original research, which was complete macular detachment. Other gene therapies are being done right now, and some of the trials are pretty advanced. There's one on choroideremia. There's the next one which may sort of uh, come out is the one on X-linked retinitis pigmentosa, the RPGR, Stargardt's disease, achromatopsia. And that's really that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jay. That's really interesting. I have one quick question for you. Do you think the uh, gene therapy has finally arrived? And what, what are your future speculation about this uh, gene therapy treatment? I think we still um, don't know what the best ways of injecting the gene under the macula. There is no doubt in my mind that, you know, there'll be more and more, uh, the next decade is more about gene therapy and stem cell research. And a lot of trials are going on actually. Uh, one trial which is pretty exciting, uh, you know, is one of my colleagues is involved in, in Manchester on that is, is AMD. Um, and on that, the, the rationale is that you upregulate the complement factor I, which is a down regulator of dry AMD progression. So the gene will upregulate that and it will reduce the progression of dry AMD. Uh, so it's certainly there now. And this is the only treatment, but it's very clear 
based on the four patients, uh, three patients, four eyes that I've done, uh, two kids we've done, they've done really well with the central uh, vision maintained, but they've just been done six weeks back and there is no if drop in the central vision. I have to objectively assess their rod function with FST, which um, is being done in about a month's time. So I haven't presented their data, but there hasn't been any side effect there. So it's very clear in my mind that it works. How long the effect lasts, we don't really know. Uh, what is the best way of injecting uh, under the retina? We don't really know whether we should inject it around the fovea because foveal detachment um, is again, is not risk-free. And it'll probably not be just limited for uh, in retinal dystrophies. There would be other indications as well in which this may become more and more um, important in the future. Yeah, thank you. I have one question from the audience. It's about phase one trial. Was that on healthy volunteers or patients with hereditary uh, retinal? No, no, no. Phase one was an RP65 mutation. Original studies were done in animals. And once they showed safety, phase one was RP65. So in total, 43 patients, 10 in phase one, and about 30, um, 10 or 11 in phase one and 31 in phase three, they have been treated with this. And their, long, their data is now up to six, seven years because the original trial was done in 2013. And there is a bit of waning of effect. Um, the effect does wane off a little, but not completely. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Asad, for joining us. Oh, we have one question from Professor. Um, Dr. Jalil, uh, thank you. This is an excellent talk. Uh, I just wonder uh, if, uh, whether you give position to the patient after uh, injections and uh, if you give air. So why I'm asking this, I don't know if it's important to uh, keep this uh, solution uh, gene on the macular area or not, because if you give face down position, and it press and it moved this uh, to the far from the uh, macular to periphery. So no, this, this is just one, right? It's not, it's yeah, no, not this my is, topic. No, this, this is a fantastic question, actually. Uh, that part I just didn't say because I thought this was a general audience, but the patients aren't meant to lie down on the back for 24 hours uh, so that the drug stays at the macula. And this is why, um, you know, air is generally not needed. If, if the bleb is there, then they just lie flat at, on the back for 24 hours. And for so, kids, it's difficult, but that's the advice, basically, uh, given. Okay. okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Abdullah, you may be uh, uh, It's your unmute. Uh, your unmute, Abdullah. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Asad. And now we'll move to our next speaker, Professor Ramzi Abechi. He's the founder of the Retina Eye Institute uh, in Turkey, and he's actually one of the most famous uh, vitreoretinal surgeon in Turkey and across the world. I have learned it myself a lot from him. Uh, he's uh, published many scientific articles and he's a member of the uh, National and International Ophthalmology Societies in Turkey and across the world. And he's talked about membranectomy in cases with complex uh, retinal detachment. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Abdullah. Can you see my screen full screen now? Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Dr. Abdullah and Dr. Ahmed Salam and uh, Suez Canal uh, University Ophthalmology team for this kind of invitation. So we'll, I will speak today about uh, treatment of complex retinal detachment, which is the most difficult case group in our retinal surgery. And mainly I will speak about membranectomy and retinectomy techniques and indication. So I have no financial disclosure related with this topic. So what's complex retinal detachment? There are several def the definitions, but one of these uh, definition was made by a retina surgeon uh, during the retina meeting and as follows and say that as an eye that had vitreoretinal surgery for retinal detachment before but you don't know what happens in the first and subsequent surgeries uh, but you can guess because there's no information uh, uh, coming with the patient and uh, usually and many surgeries silicon oil in and out and so on and silicon oil in the anterior chamber and many times also PFCL bubbles. And 
uh, an important amount of vitreous is still inside the eye, especially on the vitreous face. And usually surgery done by a general ophthalmologist that likes retina, but it's not a retina specialist. So the general mentality is silicon oil solved everything. So this is one of uh, the patients which is uh, fully uh, fits the, with this definition and come to my office after two uh, severe vitreoretinal surgery and after silicon oil removal, retina is attached again and there's severe PVR and a giant uh, retinal tear, a big uh, macular tear on the foveal area. And uh, in this patient, um, first we uh, remove the membranes on the posterior pole around the optic nerve and then uh, attach the retina and giving fluid air exchange and remove the supretinal fluid from large macular hole without touching the RP. Then inject a piece of uh, PFCL bubble to prevent passing of a dye to the supretinal space and then stain uh, the macular area and then remove the retinal membranes and we close the macular hole with uh, creating temporal ILM flap and over the macular hole area. Then. Uh, we move to the periphery of the retina, which the PVR is more uh, seriously uh, happened there in the vitreous space. These are not only membranes, most of them are compressed vitreous uh, under, the, uh, after, uh, under silicon oil uh, tamponade. So in this period, I pay attention, I give time to remove all membranes and the inferior retinectomy was made uh, already before uh, the, the previous surgery then give silicon oil injections. So this is after silicon oil removal, the retina is completely attached. We don't need, we did not need any extra retinectomy in these patients. And this is just one week after surgery, the macular hole was closed as a flat open fashion, but three months after surgery, hole is completely closed by glial proliferation. This was interesting. Under silicon oil, the macular hole closing was progressed. And uh, this is one month after uh, silicon oil removal, but macular was completely closed, but well, unfortunately the vision is not improved so much, only we obtain 0.1 vision. So PVR is one of the most challenging problems in retinal detachment surgery. And in primary detachment, we usually observe posterior PVR, however, in recurrent case, and proliferation move to the vitreous space and we usually observe anterior PVR. And therefore, surgeon, vitreous surgeon should pay attention to do their best in the first primary surgery uh, and also therefore a method that will provide the highest success rate should be preferred in primary surgery because this method can change from surgeon to surgeon. The basic principle, principle for surgery is removal of all vitreous as much as possible, release of retinal traction and close or retinal tears. So peeling of membrane is one of the most important step of complex uh, treatment of complex retinal detachment and the membranes on the vitreous base should be clean with great patience because the better membranectomy means the less need of retinectomy and the less retinectomy means less risk of chronic hypotomy after surgery. So in my uh, clinical practice, I use bimanual, uh, I perform my bimanual working during uh, membranectomy using chandelier light with wide angle illumination. I also use adjuvant agents such as tramsinol to visualize vitreous, especially on the vitreous base, dyes to visualize membranes, and peripheral carbons to fixate retina during membraneectomy. If we do a good job with uh, a drop of membrane uh, removal, we, can, uh, we may uh, provide uh, good success and we may need not need retinectomy in many patients. For example, this patient is uh, referred to us uh, after two surgery and the proliferation developed under silicone oil, there was a limited proliferation on inferior nasal quadrant, which is uh, extended to the periphery in this patient. And OCT shows uh, with macular traction, also a shallow uh, detachment of the macular uh, because of the traction. In this patient, we apply the optimized surgery only to peeling membrane. We don't, you do not do anything except membrane peelings. And also, uh, as you see, after staining on membrane, we remove first membrane with a uh, envelope fashion to the periphery, then remove uh, ILM with a, a, a staining brilliant blue again on the macular area, the rest of the ILM, and some parts already 
mode, as you see, then we just give 5% C3F8, no laser, no retinectomy, because there is no retinal tear on this patient. And three weeks after surgery, as you see, retina is completely attached in this patient. Uh, there was limited membranes. And we, uh, also we ob obtained a good visual acuity to 20 or 30 vision, and the macular configuration was almost normal. This is another patient. This is 10 years old boy come to my office, again referred with after two uh, operation and this proliferation happened under a silicone oil tamponade. And again, we stain the membranes and peel all the membranes from uh, posterior well to the periphery. And again, in this patient, we, don't not, we did not need to do retinectomy. We applied 360 laser silicone oil injection and three months later, we removed the silicone oil Retina was completely attached. There was no reproliferation, and we have blood sclerotic fixation implantation with iris component, and the vision has still 0.6 vision after this surgery. This is another patient, and this patient referred to us from abroad, and we applied by uh, combined surgery. And this is primary case. It was chronic retinal detachment. The past history was about three months, and after COVID tracheotomy, we remove start to remove membrane from posterior wall to do periphery first, the posterior pole, then inject PFCL, step-by-step -step attached retina, then membranes uh, peeling around the equators. And finally, uh, we move to the vitreous space, clean all the membranes, vitreous as much as possible. This is the original tear, there was only tear. There is no uh, other tear. And even in this very difficult case, after a good membranectomy, we managed to reattach retina without uh, uh, retinectomies. And this is, uh, after silicone oil removal. Unfortunately, this patient has only 120 vision because of the chronic uh, retinal detachment. This is another patient. In this patient, PVR developed uh, after a synchroparacial scleral buckle surgery. Again, usually, as you see, always, almost always work by manually. Membrane pick is very, very helpful, very good instrument uh, during this mem uh, working by manually. In this patient, there was retinal fault in its inferior temporal chasm, but retina was relaxed enough, and therefore I did not do retinectomy. And I just give a gas uh, tamponade, uh, not silicon oil. Uh, and this is after a surgery, as you see, retina is completely attached. And uh, on the uh, retinal fault area, there is no uh, proliferation and detachment again. So, uh, this is not possible in all cases, even though we can do a good membrane action because of contraction, fibrosis, and atrophy of intrinsic retinal elements may cause retinal for shortening. And this shortening uh, particularly occur in the vitreous space and prevents retinal reattachment unless retinectomy or buckle uh, is performed. So both techniques, uh, buckle and retinectomy, achieve good anatomic results. And we, uh, there are several combination of these uh, two techniques in this uh, to reattach that make these complex cases. Uh, but the important thing is the surgeon should apply the best technique in his own experience. And usually in recurrent case, in complex uh, retinal detachment case, I prefer retinectomy, vitrectomy instead of uh, scleral buckle. Usually I almost can say that uh, almost never use scleral buckle in recurrent cases. Uh, also, I experienced that for most retinal detachments, uh, especially in recurrence case, scleral buckle is unnecessarily overrated and it may not be necessary when traction are adequate to relieve with retinectomies. There are many studies on literature which show good anatomic uh, results after uh, retinectomy. And for example, this patient again referred to us with uh, inferior uh, retinal detachment. Uh, after uh, silicon oil removal and scleral buckle surgery. As you see, there is no uh, visible proliferation uh, here, but the retina is uh, uh, attached, detached because there is a shortening of the retina behind the scleral buckle. And therefore, there is only way to reattach this retina uh, to do retinectomy, 180 degree retinectomy inferior part of the retina. And we did this. And usually in this case, I prefer selective diatomy only to the diatomy to the uh, large vessels area. Then uh, I do retinectomy, retinotomy uh, on the age of scleral uh, indentation, and um, then uh, do laser after reattaching the retina with PFCL, both anterior and posterior uh, border of the retinectomy. And 
uh, again, in this patient, I prefer a 12% C3 F8 gas tamponade. This is three weeks after surgery, as you see, still uh, uh, one third of the vitreous cavity is full of gas and retina is attached inferiorly. Another patient, again, uh, this is recurrent case, proliferation on the posterior pole, anterior PVR, and also open retinal tear on the periphery. And in this patient, again, we have to do retinectomy because even we peel all the membrane, there was shortening of the retina, it was not uh, possible to attach the retina. We prefer 200, almost 200 uh, retinectomy and remove supretinal proliferation also. And with the same fashion, we apply laser both anterior and posterior uh, border of the retinectomy. And in this patient, because of the size of retinectomy, we prefer silicone oil. And uh, this is the final results of the surgery. And this is uh, after surgery, then we remove the silicone oil. Again, this patient we obtain uh, 0.2 vision uh, after surgery, after silicone oil removal. This is the last case that I will show you. This is another patient with uh, very uh, severe um, proliferations. This is chronic case, atrophic retinal, multiple retinal uh, atrophic tears. And uh, even we peel all the membrane in this patient, it was not possible to reattach the retina because of uh, shortening of the retina onto a posterior location. And therefore we decide to do 360 retinectomy in this patient as uh, much periphery as possible. And in such patient, we I pay attention to remove all anterior retinal flap and the vitreous on the vitreous space to prevent ciliary body proliferation and traction to prevent chronic hypotony, then apply laser and in this patient, again, we prefer silicone oil because of chronic hypotony that we hesitate. But uh, in this patient, there was no hypotony. And after silicone oil removal, this is one eye patient. The retina is completely attached and we obtain um, ambulatory vision for this patient. So uh, in uh, conclusion, uh, for in complex retinal detachment, in all cases, but yes, this is in complex reta detachment is really important. We should do the right operation. What's mean and radical anterior base dissection is very important. Lens extremity when necessary. Membranectomy and retinectomy is the other important step. Sometimes you may need radial retinectomy and then laser and silicone oil or gas tamponade. So also we should do the operation right. And these are not real emergency case and we should match the grade of detachment to the experienced surgeon and time of surgery important, but we should better to wait for the experienced retinal surgeon uh, and also we should prefer regular operating day instead of emergency condition. And the other point is in this patient, I try to optimize my surgery as much as possible to reduce manipulation as less as possible to control inflammation. So there are several complications of uh, retinectomy such as hypotony, but this is really controversial, we don't know uh, if there's any causal relationship between retinectomy and post-op hypotony. Um, there are several studies on the literature show that ciliary body shutdown due to the anterior PVR and traction might be the main problem rather than retinectomies. So in summary, the membranectomy should be performed with the great patient in complex retinal detachment. Retinectomy helps us to reattach the retina in many complex retinal detachment and stipular buckle may not be necessary when the traction on the retina can be relieved adequately with uh, retinectomy, especially in a recurrent case. And buckle might be preferred for selected case in the primary procedure, such as young, packaged, myopic eyes or hereditary vitreoidal degeneration cases with severe vitreous-based uh, adhesion. Thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you very much, Professor Ramsey. That's really interesting. So when we come across one of these cases, we'll refer them to you. Thank you. So a very <laughs> different topic than previous. So, but this is my uh, practice. Yeah, I, I, I think I have the same, very similar feeling that in many situations that uh, segmental buckles is really unnecessary in these situations. And I wonder if uh, Mr. Button has an has the same agree with us or what he prefers. 
Uh, thanks, Abdullah. Yeah, so I don't generally do a buckling uh, procedure for diabetic vitrectomies and complex DLAMs. Um, and I try, I mean, every practice is different. Um, and a large sort of direction in what our practices is led by who's trained us and what we've learned as trainees. And um, I think there was, there was a period of time when buckles were used more often, um, but not so much nowadays in, in the units in the UK. Um, and, and I also try and not use silicon oil wherever possible. Um, but of course, in certain situations, particularly the, the, the very complex cases that Professor Abchi has presented, uh, you, you may have no choice but to use silicon oil in those. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Ramsey, for this interesting presentation. And please stay with us. And we'll move to sure. Mr. Nial Button. So Mr. Button is a senior veterinary consultant at Manchester Royal Eye Hospital. He's the director of the International Fellowship. He published over 80 peer-reviewed publications and authored many chapters. And up to my knowledge, he's a tennis player and marathon runner. Is that correct? <laughs> uh, marathons are well past now, no, no longer. Knees cannot carry it anymore. So just a little bit of tennis. <laughs> yes, he will present today. Uh, the, the title of his presentation is about macular hole, its macular hole classification and update. So please go ahead. Thank you very much, Abdallah. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, so I've, I'm delighted to be invited to discuss in this meeting um, some retinal updates. And I just wanted you really, I'm really going to go through just one large study that we did in Manchester about a year and a half ago and use it to try and persuade people to um, update their uh, classification of macular holes and in particular uh, large macular holes. So um, when we think of classification of macular holes, we think of this gentleman, Donald Gass, um, who's the doyen of, of retina uh, for, for many years. And uh, this is his original classification of uh, macular hole pathology. So this dates, this is his modified classification from 1995. Um, I actually haven't been able to obtain a copy of the original uh, classification, which was in 1988. But you can see uh, we're all familiar with the sta various stages of one macular holes and then stage two, three, and four, depending on the size and presence of traction. And certainly in my training, um, that was the mainstay of, of classification for macular holes. Um, and if we look at those images and we now think of what we know about the underlying etiology of macular holes, actually, it was remarkable that he was so accurate in, in describing the pathophysiology for macular holes. So they've been very worthwhile and very useful, but we must uh, you know, concede that this was before the time of OCT retinal imaging. One of the things, this is his original, or his 1995 paper, one of the things I've just pointed out and highlighted here for you to see is the sentence, I suggest that all holes less than 400 micrometers in diameter be considered as stage two holes. And this, ever since this figure of 400 micrometers has really become ophthalmic folklore. So it's, it's what we now uh, use as our classification for macular holes, even up to this day. And it would be really interesting to know, and if anyone in the audience ha has any sense or ideas where this 400 micrometers has come from would be really worthwhile because it's very unclear, it's slightly arbitrary, um, it might be related to the, the potential diameter of the location of xanthophile pigment within the favea, or relate to the yellow spot um, or the ring of tissue in his original classification. But it's really not clear of where this figure of 400 micrometers has arisen. And it's been useful. So there have been lots of studies looking at effect. For example, you know that during macular hole surgery, we sometimes posture, sometimes we don't, sometimes we peel, sometimes we don't. And certainly studies have indicated that it serves to demarcate certain effects um, around the 400 micrometer size. So it hasn't, it, it has had a lot of utility, but still its origin is uncertain. 
And so that took us to a classification which we've been all brought up on and, and used for many years. And I've got to say many units still use that as a classification. But in inverted commas, the new classification, I say inverted commas because this is now paper from 2013. But the International Victor Macular Traction Society suggested that we need to update our uh, grading and classification of macular holes. And they produced this new scheme. Um, the, the origin of this um, uh, paper was really around the time of ochroplasmin for um, vitro macular traction. But if we concentrate on the macular hole section, so they now classify small as less than 250 microns, medium between 250 and 400, and then large greater than 400. And now we're meant to record the state of the vitreous. So is there or is there not vitro macular traction in conjunction with that macular hole? And so really, um, since 2013, this is the new classification that we should be using. So we shouldn't be talking about stage three macular holes or stage four, stage two macular holes. Really, this is, that should be consigned to history. And this is the new classification that we should all be using. But note, uh, they still use the figure of 400 microns. Um, and again, with some justification, because like I said earlier, it has demonstrated some ability to discern um, the, the distinction between uh, certain functions like face down positioning, etc. So, so that's why they've justified continuing to use the figure of 400 microns. But the problem with this is that the, the studies that use 400 microns use it because it was historically used. And now we're saying because those studies have been done, we should continue to use the 400 microns. So we're going around a little bit in a circle. And we undertook a, a retrospective study in Manchester, and we wanted to try and better define when is a macular hole a large macular hole. And, and by that, I mean, when does it behave differently from your average small or medium sized macular hole? When is it less likely to close for surgery um, compared to smaller size macular holes. And the utility of that is if we can identify that, it might serve as a cutoff where we say standard surgery is required for macular holes less than that size. And then above it, we can then entertain doing ILM flaps or faveal sparing ILM peels or whatever particular adjunct that, that the individual surgeon would like, because now a defined measurement where the macular hole is less likely to close. So as I said, we, we looked at our over a five year period from our retinal database that we've been collected among all the retinal surgeons in Manchester between those two time periods. And we published this in the American Journal of Ophthalmology in, at the end of 2018. Um, the stand, it was standard surgery. So all these macular holes were standard vitrectomy, ILM peel, gas tamponade, some variation with face down positioning and we excluded anyone who had a macular hole of uh, smaller than 400 microns, and they needed a three-month follow-up um, for the study. And we used the usual measurement that we used, uh, denoted here with the letter A. So the minimum linear diameter was the size of the macular hole. So here's our results. So in total, we had 258 patients that we managed to identify. And you can see, as, as we'd expect, they, they tend to be on the elderly side and females were affected twice as often as males. And um, when we look at the actual distribution of the size of the macular holes, obviously the minimum was 400. And you can see this histogram demonstrating that show the median size was around 560 microns. Uh, they tail off around 850 microns and then a few very large outliers around over a thousand microns, so 1400 microns or so. So that's the range of distribution of the macular holes we were looking at. And we found in this population, so remember, based on the old classification, these are large macular holes. Overall, we're pretty pleased with what our success rate was. It was about 90% success rate. And no surprise when we analyzed those that did close with primary surgery versus those that remained open, there was a significant difference in size. So those that closed, the average size was around 550 microns. Those that remained open, the average size was around 700 microns. And if we look then and divide the data into quartiles, so you can see for the first three quartiles for the macular hole size, 
the success of the surgery was actually really high. It was all above 90%. Um, which is in really in keeping with studies looking at, at macular holes of much smaller size, so small and medium-sized macular holes. Then move to, to the fourth quartile. So now we're dealing with more than 650 microns. And the, uh, the closure rate really plummets dramatically down to about 76%. So using a, a, an analysis of these as quartiles, you would say that something changes around 650 microns that indicates that the success of macular hole closure is, is, is significantly reduced at a size beyond that. We did an ROC analysis, um, and so we were looking at the ability of the preoperative macular hole size as a dichotomous variable. Will it succeed, i.e. will the, will the um, operation close, will the macular hole close, or will the macular hole remain open? And we found that again, a value, it was specifically about 630 microns. This was uh, the optimum inflection point or value where you get the maximum sensitivity and specificity. And um, this tells us that based on this data set, a value of around 630 microns uh, is the value at which the macular holes start to become less likely to close. So now they're starting to behave like large macular holes as opposed to small and medium macular holes. So that's really just saying um, 650 microns. How does our results compare with other data um, in other studies? Well, Gupta um, looked at uh, about 130 eyes. Again, anatomical success uh, quite high at 86%. They divided those greater than 400 and it went down to about 77%. Um, and again, a significant association with size and anatomical closure. But if I ask you to look at the figure of greater than 500, you can see in their cases in particular, again, it significantly deteriorates. Whereas between 400 and 500, actually, it's very similar to um, the, the general uh, closure rate, so 87%. Since our study, then the, the beavers grip, and so for, for our, our colleagues in Egypt, uh, beavers is the British and Irish Association of Vitreatal Surgeons, and they have a database whereby ophthalmologists or vitreatal surgeons specifically can put in all their data relating to primary retinal detachments and primary macular holes. And so potentially over a long period of time, you can accrue a lot of data from different surgeons in the UK. And so they decided then to look at their, um, their data with success of macular hole closure. And again, specifically in those that had a large macular hole. And they had about a total of, I think, 1,200 patients in their study that they were able to uh, examine. And they find a, a, an inflection point, if you like, or a change in behavior of success of closure around 500 micrometers. So if you remember, we found a value of around six. 30, 650, their value was around 500 micrometers. And they, they analyzed it slightly differently. This is a, a, an accumulation frequency of the macular hole diameter for closure. And so you can see um, the percentage of eyes that didn't close was very, very low for everything up until about 400, 450 microns. And then around 500, it starts to uh, decrease. And they broke up their data into uh, 50 micron intervals, so less than 200, all the way up to greater than 600. And again, where I've marked with an arrow, you can see around 500 microns, the success rate is starting to deteriorate. So, so based on their data, they would say that between 400 and 500 microns, the success rate is really similar to medium and small size macular holes. But beyond 500, it is changing in its uh, in its um, in, in the mechanism of the macular hole closing. It's becoming less likely, it's behaving differently. Um, just just as, a, as an aside, so the Beaver study, if you read the title, it's a, it's a prospective cohort. We've got to be a little bit careful with the Beaver study, although it's described as consecutive and prospective. Um, any retinal surgeon in the UK has a window of about four months from the time of the surgery to put the data in. And actually their overall success rate for macular holes greater than 500 microns was very high. Um, it was around the 90% level. And there's always the possibility that people are being selective 
when they put data into the Beavers data set, because within the UK, it may be used for revalidation or appraisal or departmental audit. So we've got to be a little bit careful when we describe it as a prospective cohort. Um, but if we compare it with ours, so, you know, in our study, we find the value of around 650. In the Beaver study, around 500. The exact value which will confirm where the macula hole changes and its closure rate significantly drops is yet to be determined. And really, to do that, we need a prospective proper uh, study. Um, but it's certainly indicating that uh, the figure of 400 is no longer relevant. And certainly our study, you would indicate maybe that large macular holes currently classified as greater than 400. Maybe we need to classify large from 400 to 650 and then beyond 650, give it a new classification. And we just describe those now within Manchester in our unit on our data set as very large macular holes so we can analyze them separately in the future. And certainly generally the consensus among the surgeons in Manchester, and I'm interested in, in the audience and any, any opinions on this, um, and members of the panel, but our, our opinion in Manchester is if you have a macular hole up to about 650 microns, we really treat it very similar to uh, a 400 micron macular hole. So we'll ask them to position, uh, but we'll do a standard peel. And anything above 650 microns, then we'll consider alternatives such as island flaps, et cetera. And, and you know, it might sound slightly academic and uninteresting. Well, what's the big deal about classifying macular holes? But this is a paper, um, the PIM study, which I'm sure uh, the retinal surgeons in the audience will have read recently. And this was a, an attempt at a randomized controlled trial um, published about two months ago. And the, the trial was determining, does face down positioning for large macular holes make a difference? And their outcome was very, very close to proving that it does. So um, the success rate for face down positioning was 95%. And the success rate for not face down positioning, so they put them in a face forward uh, role, was 85%. So that's quite a difference. But unfortunately, it didn't quite meet statistical significance. So I think the p values there at the bottom of the, of the slide, 0.08. Now, most people, I think, would conclude we find a significant trend for face down positioning um, having a higher closure rate, but they were very honest and they said we have not demonstrated any benefit or proven any benefit for face down. But again, their classification of what they mean by a large macular hole was the historical 400 micrometers. And one can imagine if you did that study on a, even 500 micron macular holes or 650 micron macular holes, it would have been much more likely that this powered study would have actually determined a significant difference and we'd have an answer about the role of face down positioning for these patients. So I think it's still very relevant uh, even for current retinal surgery. So just to conclude, um, we in our study found a cutoff of around 650 microns. The true figure will require a prospective consecutive study. As I said, that the Beavers data set was around 500 microns. And um, alternative techniques such as nylon flap may be considered for this subset of patients, I think, who are greater than that value. But we find very high success rates of closure. You can discuss visual acuity outcomes, of course, with techniques such as island flaps. But for closure, um, standard uh, vitrectomy peel and gas seems to work very well for macular holes up to this size. And I'd just like to acknowledge all my colleagues, including Assad, who was speaking earlier, um, and all my colleagues in Manchester. And uh, this is the Manchester Eye Hospital on the left. That's the old. And now we've moved into the building on the right. And if any of our colleagues, hopefully when all this coronavirus is over, if any of your colleagues ever come to Manchester, and would like to visit, we'd be really welcome to have them with us because uh, it's always good to meet people face-to-face -face rather than on Zoom meetings. So I will now mute and, and uh, take any questions. Thank you very much. And thank you, Abdallah, for the kind invite. Yeah, may, may, many thanks, Mr. Button, for this interesting presentation. And I totally agree with you that 400 was an arbitrary number. Interestingly, Gas put these numbers many years ago, but actually he was really clever because his classification is more or less still valid. But how to reflect that uh, the, if we put 650 micron as a large hole in the gas classification, should we say that stage four large hole or stage four B? 
course, one of my concerns with gas classification is that sometimes you get cases with total BVD, but the size is still then less than 400 micron. So how to put that together? Really simply, um, I, I don't allow trainees or fellows in my department to use gas as classification. So I have to now describe the new international vitromacular society's classification of small, medium and large, with or without traction. And then peculiarly in Manchester, because we did the study, we describe very large, so we just use that as a classification for 650. But, but we no longer, for the reasons you pointed out, that you can have a smaller macular hole still with vitreous traction and a larger one without. So we don't use gas as classification at all anymore. It served its time, but its time has been and gone. Yeah, and uh, what, what's your preferred technique for those over 650? As you, what, what I have noticed over the past uh, five years, uh, on the east side of the globe, there is a new tendency to do eye limb flaps eye, uh, and so on, but in the West, where US and UK, these techniques are not very popular compared to the uh, rest of the world. So um, for larger than 650, we're tending to do favial sparing ILM flaps. So peeling right up to the edge of the favia, trimming it, and then doing just a normal gas exchange with five days face down positioning. Um, one or two of my colleagues still flap, do a temporal flap and um, get the patient, you know, peel over uh, the, the temporal side and with the air exchange, try and get the ILM to flap over the central macula. But generally, um, I, I do a favial sparing ILM. But who knows whether it makes a difference or not. Yeah, and uh, what, one last question from my side. Do you do OCT on the day of the surgery, because sometimes there is like a gap of one or two or three months before the surgery, and there is a proven evidence yeah. that the hole may enlarge during this period. We do. So, um, and again, historically we haven't, but over the past two to three years, we've started uh, always doing an OCT on the day of surgery um, or VMT always on the day because uh, of changes of size, very small macular holes may have closed spontaneously and you may be doing surgery unnecessarily. And um, it's actually become quite difficult recently purely because of coronavirus. So we now have all these green and amber wards, et cetera, and the imaging is in the amber area, the patient's covered negative in a green area. So to get the imaging on the day is proving problematic. So we're actually asking them to come in three, four days in, uh, in advance of the surgery just for the OCT but gold standard for sure, OCT on the day of surgery. Yeah, thank you very much. Any question? Oh, I think Professor Ramsey, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Patton. This, uh, I agree with you about the size of macular hole, in, especially in um, macular hole is over 500 micron. Uh, island flap works better than standard technique. And uh, also I experienced that uh, single layer inversions such as temporal inverted flap uh, gives better anatomic and functional results comparing the standard conventional ILM flap technique. Conventional, I mean 360 cover, uh, peel the ILM and cover the ILM over the macular hole. In this technique, usually ILM go into the hole area and uh, prevent uh, proliferations and also prevent uh, recovery of photoreceptors uh, layers uh, in when you go into the whole area. But in single uh, layer inversion, such as temporal inverted flap, when you invert as a single layer, as, so it's not really difficult case, uh, so techniques, and uh, it's uh, covered the macular hole area and uh, under the ILM, the glial proliferation may uh, be a, a, a perfectly a smooth proliferation and the macular configuration after uh, healing process is much uh, close to the standard uh, macular configuration than the other insertion technique. Do you have an experience about these two techniques or uh, what do you think about that? So um, I, I've not done any temporal flaps. Um, the only flaps that I do, the peels that I do are the foveal sparing. I don't physically try and put the ILM in the macular hole itself. So I just trim it and, and leave it um, and then do my air exchange as per normal. And it's very interesting what you're saying about better visual outcomes and better anatomical resolution of the macular hole. And, and, 
And, and I'm sure some of these techniques, there will be differences in anatomical success and visual success. And what would be really nice is some studies to really analyze these and maybe doing some form of trial to see, because at the moment it's very hodgepodge. So lots of surgeons, they like to do this, others like to do that. And we really don't have the data to be able to tell us which technique um, is the optimal technique for these macular holes. Um, but certainly for anything less than a 650 micron macular hole, certainly in Manchester, we're just doing a standard peel. So a 360 ILM peel, no flap, no remnant around the actual macular hole itself. Uh, and we feel we're getting good closure and good visual results relative for, for these patients will, who will naturally have a worse visual outcome because of the size of the macular hole. Thank you. Thanks. One, one more question. Uh, what, what's your preferred bolstering regimen after the surgery? Do you do face down or just uh, what's your preferred? So again, um, there will, there will, so my own personal view, and, I, and I've, this is what I've done, again, why? Largely because of my training. So if they're less than 400 microns, I tend to position them either for a few hours or overnight, face down, and then they have no more positioning, but I ask them not to lie on their back. Um, and then for greater than 400 mm -hmm. microns, and note I say 400, not 650, for greater than 400 microns, I will position them face down for five days, um, just during the day. And the reason is um, all the evidence to date is indicating, although it hasn't been confirmed, it's indicating that on balance, the closure is better. And the PIM study was desperately close to finding a statistical difference. And to me, it, it was a brilliantly designed study that just was slightly underpowered for that, you know, for the numbers not to prove statistically significant. And for me, it's convincing that five days face down positioning is more likely to close those larger macular holes. Yeah. And one thing I have noticed that those with posturing face down for a few days, the restoration of the outer retina is usually better than those without any face down posturing. I'm not sure if this is uh, just my own observation or do, what do you feel about that? Well, I haven't observed it myself, but maybe that's because everyone that I'm positioning, you know, I'm positioning everyone in that situation face down. Um, but remember the PIMS trial also demonstrated what it did find was that there were better visual outcomes in those that position face down compared to those that were asked to position face forwards. So, so your, your observation might be a potential explanation as to why visually they've done better. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you again, till we meet. <laughs> yes, and then we move to uh, our next speaker, Mr. Mark Costin. He's a consultant, virtual retinal surgeon. He's the virtual retinal lead at Hull University Teaching Hospital, and he's actually the clinical lead as well. He has a special interest in micro-incision vitreoretinal surgery and complex diabetic retinopathy. And he will talk today about uh, diabetic delamination tips and pitfalls. So Mark, please go ahead. Abdallah, thanks very much for inviting me and for that very grand, undeserved introduction. I'm uh, just uh, really gonna share experience of uh, managing some diabetics during what's been a very challenging year for all of us, I think. Um, and very much a journey as a surgeon transitioning to, to smaller gauge surgery, but hopefully we'll, we'll can have some discussion at the end. So um, we think about going back to some, some basics. So we think about what delamination is. Well, obviously it is, is actually separating a material uh, into thin sheets. And as we know, as, as vitreoretinal surgeons, the, the, the real importance of finding the correct tissue plane uh, before we, as we start our, our delamination surgery. Uh, and if we don't, then we can end up getting into, into difficulties. And if we think about some very, very basic uh, principles of, of managing tractional uh, of, of diabetic vitrectomy, we're thinking we're clearing vitreous opacification. Uh, we have the important goal of relieving the traction uh, on the retina, uh, reattaching the retina, and hopefully uh, helping regression of the neovascular process. So diabetic vitrectomy, as we know, has been going for some time. Um, and even in the, in the earlier days, the, uh, a significant number of patients 
had good good visual outcome from diabetic vitrectomy. So we know it's effective. And as technology is advanced, uh, it's become increasingly safer. In the ETRS study, um, a, a certain proportion of patients require vitrectomy and half of those actually require vitrectomy for tractional detachment. And in the diabetic complications control trial, uh, five and a half percent of patients underwent vitrectomy, um, but that the need for vitrectomy was reduced by 45% in that arm that, that had good diabetic control. These are our kind of our historical benchmarks. Um, And we found obviously the earlier vitrectomy in the type one diabetics in the diabetic vitrectomy study, those patients uh, fared better. And this was with 20 gauge surgery, uh, conventional vitrectomy. And as we've moved to smaller gauge, uh, we've, we've, we've gained better outcomes, but we still have, uh, there are obviously still a significant number of complications. We'll come to that in a bit. The, the best pre-op prognostic indicator remains the preoperative vision. As we know, globally, it's, a, it's an increasing problem, uh, increasing prevalence of diabetes, particularly in the young. Um, we know that eye departments uh, globally are, are suffering with capacity issues. Um, we've, we've noticed locally as well as, as uh, laser techniques changed um, with the introduction of pattern laser. There was a bit of a learning curve with that as well. And uh, we certainly went through a phase of, of, of a number of patients requiring vitrectomy for non-clearing hemorrhage because they were basically undertreated with the pattern laser. We had to learn to, to apply more laser uh, and there's better evidence for that now. And then of course, this came along. Now this is a, a, a pollution map over China. Um, this was baseline uh, in 2020 before, before lockdown began. And this, these were the pollution levels during lockdown. And then this was during the recovery. Um, and Along with lockdown, certainly in the UK, much of diabetic retinal screening was suspended. Um, and that together with the need to prioritize our patients, to try and make sure patients were safe coming into our buildings, uh, do, did require a reconfiguration of our services. And unfortunately, um, there was some collateral damage with a number of our patients along the way. And I'm sure many of us are, are still feeling the effects of that. If we think about the pathogenesis of tractional detachment is important to think about that when we're thinking about how we treat it. We know that hyperglycemia induces angiogenesis, uh, and we know that as well as the, the, the effect on blood vessels, hyperglycemia alter, also alters the, the collagen cross-linking, promoting liquefaction and synergesis. And as, as that develops, that induces more and more axial and tangential traction. And we also know that traction on blood vessels is a neovascular stimulus. Um, the blood vessels, as, as we know, grow forward, the anchor onto cortical vitreous, and it is a vicious cycle of hemorrhage, increasing fibrosis at that interface, and then uh, ongoing traction. And then we were thinking about that um, angiogenic stimulus, and we think about therapeutic approaches, we think about the use of anti-VEGF agents, but we're also bearing in mind that there is that pro-fibrotic switch at some point where that may lead to further traction. We'll touch on that in a, in a little while. There's this a, quite an elegant article in, uh, in the in 2019 survey, which I've just quoted there, survey of ophthalmology, uh, really an update on techniques and, and, and management of diabetic retinopathy and, and very well worth a, a read through. Um, if we're thinking back, we know we have busy clinics and, and sometimes we might be seeing patients virtually in the first instance. Um, or referred to us via an MDT, via other colleagues. It's really important, isn't it, for us to go back to basics. And, and when we, we see that patient, we think about that patient as an individual, we do a thorough uh, investigation with all the information available to us. And the reason for that is that uh, the more detail we have beforehand from both B-scan, OCT, um, OCTA, if we have it, so we can evaluate how much macular ischemia there is, uh, the better the better position we are to um, uh, plan the surgery and, and, and hopefully not ha have any surprises when we actually get inside the eye. Um, and obviously the use of fluorescein angiography preoperatively can help. Quite often there's hemorrhage and we, and we can't, see, can't, can't see the fundus. 
Abdullah touched on a point earlier when he said that actually sometimes you see a patient in the clinic and then there can be a significant delay before you operate. You know, we might have a busy list. It's still important, isn't it, just to pause and have a look at that patient just to see what's changed. Um, have the, has the patient had enough preoperative PRP? Have we used anti-VEGF? Uh, and and what, what's the timing of the surgery afterwards? All these things are things we can think about. If we're fortunate enough to have intraoperative OCT, that can also be very helpful in finding those tissue planes. Again, not many of us have access to that. Wide field imaging of course has been a real godsend. And, um, the ability to see how much laser the patients had to perform wide field angiography. And if we're thinking about doing a bit more laser in surgery, then we can think about um, trying to titrate it. So rather than putting heavy PRP, which might induce a bit more traction and fibrosis, we can use targeted treatment intraoperatively to those residual ischemic areas rather than a fairly heavy, heavy approach. And it's important, uh, as we know, to, to counsel the patient. I mean, we can end up with quite a nice anatomical appearance, but as, if we've lost the outer retinal layers, if there's significant macular ischemia, the patient's never going to see well. Uh, and we do have to have that frank discussion about what, what our aims and objectives in that particular patient are. Preoperative uh, anti-VEGF has, has been a bit of a game changer with uh, diabetic delamination, um, but it also does raise some interesting issues. Uh, there's good, good evidence from a number of sources that it can reduce your bleeding, the risk of developing uh, iatrogenic tears, patients less likely to need tamponade, shorter surgery times, less use of diathermy. Diathermy in itself can induce further traction and, and scarring. Better visual outcomes at one and six months, less incidence of early post-operative uh, hemorrhage, although late onset of vitreous hemorrhage tends not to be affected by it. And we can all recall those cases where we've injected the anti-VEGF uh, a few days beforehand, and then we have a, a relatively avascular operated field where the, the membranes peel away nicely. We, uh, we'll, we'll also all have those, have those cases where it seems to have made very little difference, uh, but I guess we would never know if, unless we hadn't used it. So kind of the key, key things are, there are a number of, this is a meta-analysis of, of a number of studies looking at pre-operative uh, pre um, anti-VEGF compared with, with no pre-operative anti-VEGF. And on a number of parameters, uh, there is a definite statistically significant um, beneficial effect uh, in reducing hemorrhage and reducing those complications, as, we, as I mentioned earlier. From a basic science point of view, and angiogenesis slows down five to 10 days post-injection, but the contractile markers, uh, that, that fibre switch begins even on day three. Uh, and of course, we end up having that, that thought, that discussion where, whereby the worry is that if we're late with the surgery after injecting the anti-VEGF agent, uh, that we might end up worsening the tractional detachment. Uh, and, and the worst case scenario end up ending up with a combined regmatogenous tractional detachment that's difficult to treat. Uh, and again, this has obviously been an issue this last year when we think about the prospects of getting a patient in for an injection. And then for whatever reason, whether it's redeployed theatre staff, whether the surgeon's self-isolating, the patient's self-isolating, for some reason that surgery doesn't go ahead. Uh, and then there is that, that risk. And obviously there are reports in the literature of patients who've had uh, increasing tractional detachment. Um, one or two of the, the larger series and the, the meta-analysis actually show that it's, it's a very rare event, but it's still at the back of our mind that we could end up with a much worse surgical situation. So COVID didn't do us any favors at all, really. So this is a patient who has very, very ischemic fundi, right and left. And unfortunately, a patient and as well had quite significant comorbidities and was admitted to hospital with, with other things. And as a consequence of that, plus uh, some delays due to COVID, had significant delay of four or five months. Uh, ended up with bilateral tractional rectal detachments. Um, and in the left eye had a combined tractional regmatogenous detachment. Ended up with silicon oil tamponade. And it has maintained a degree of navigational vision in one eye but again very very poor outcome and 
looking along that patient's journey, there were obviously it was a very it wasn't a well patient anyway, but that it may, we are aware that there are potential areas of delay where we really need if we could we would have stepped in sooner. So do we get to a point where we see a patient where is do we have a, a, a cutoff? Is there, is there a point where we think, is there actually any benefits of surgery? Um, how much ischemia is it? How young is the patient? We know that the younger patients tend to do well. Their, their macula is more forgiving, uh, where they've had a, an area, a time of prolonged macular detachment. Um, there is evidence of improvement in visual acuity, however, even with macular detachment up to six months. Um, so the question, we have to weigh all these factors up when we're thinking about and counseling the patient. We also have to remember, as well as, as, as all those, that all that information we're taking from the eye, that these are really not well patients at all. Um, and a study from Illinois showed that the, the mean survival after diagnosis of attractional detachment was two and two, just over two and a half years, uh, with an overall um, case of mor mortality of about 50% over 10 years. So these patients have very significant comorbidities. The Patients, as, uh, there's a study in the South African Medical Journal that there is a significant adverse effect when patients are delayed in their surgery. Patient outcomes tend to be worse. They develop other complications. Uh, obviously, it's important as much as possible to optimize their control in terms of their retinopathy, but also in terms of their fitness for anesthesia, if that's required. Again, these are images taken from the, the survey article. They nicely illustrate the fact that actually there, there isn't the kind of one, one size fits all when it comes to an approach. Uh, we've moved from 20 gauge to 27 gauge uh, and vastly improved cutter technology, uh, the use of chandelier enabling bimanual surgery. And for many of us, when we're approaching that uh, patient, it can be a combination of segmentation and delamination. We have to uh, can in a sense uh, um, plan as we go along, uh, depending on where we can find the, the tissue plane. Um, but obviously the key thing is to, to, to be able to delaminate the tissues without causing uh, collateral damage, such as posterior iatrogenic breaks. Sometimes we get some clues preoperatively. So a significant amount of subhyaloid hemorrhage does show us that clinically where there may be a, a, a tissue plane that we can we can access where there may have that traction may have been relieved already but obviously if we can't see anything we're very much reliant on the on dynamic b scan so i'm a, definitely a transitioning surgeon i've got a very limited experience of 27 gauge uh, but very quickly learned that it's important to uh, to lower the placement of the superior ports to sort of towards three and nine o'clock uh, because it's very difficult with the with the very thin instrumentation to actually tackle twelve and nine uh, the twelve o'clock position uh, when you have your ports placed too too superiorly and I find that you it's, it's much easier access if you lower those superior ports to the three and nine o'clock. But the one of the clear advantages is with the twenty seven gauge cutter is that um, the with the port so near the tip. Um, it is, and obviously with such a fine, uh, small caliber instrument, it's possible to get very near the retina uh, and safely segment. And uh, I don't show too much of it here, but delaminate tissues without having to use delamination scissors. Um, so potentially less instrumentation. And we know that obviously introducing scissors repeatedly through the ports is possibly a slightly higher risk of entry site break. So, there are lesser, in, there are fewer instrument changes, uh, and because the port opening is near the tip, um, quite often you don't need to use a flute needle either. So you can actually safely aspirate hemorrhage from the surface of the retina. Uh, and obviously, this is using the Bausch and Lomb Stellaris system. Um, and clearly, obviously, with high cut rates uh, and the and the improvement in fluidics, the surgery tends to be tends to be much safer. However, there are. This is a, a, a patient who, unfortunately, uh, 
for other reasons was delayed for uh, some time before his surgery. He's Afro-Caribbean patient. Um, and sometimes we want to go for something that's more familiar. Uh, and I knew this was going to be a fairly complex case. So I actually resorted to back to 25 gauge initially with a chandelier, which I ended up abandoning because I actually found it was preventing me from rotating the eye properly. Um, but this ended up being a, a, a complex vitrectomy under local anesthesia because he was a very high uh, risk from general anesthetic. And he had these broad sheets of fibrovascular proliferation, which were very, very adherent to incredibly thin retina. Now, this is a patient that uh, this was the, during the beginning of the second surge of coronavirus. And we were having significant staffing issues and potential of theater closures. And for various reasons, we opted not to give preoperative anti-VEGF. And of course, yes, you always wish you had used it uh, because I was quite concerned that if for whatever reason I wasn't able to go back in, uh, the problem in this case was that the patient, this was about an hour and a half into the surgery, could not get a tissue plane. So I had to fill the eye with silicon oil uh, and come back again. The patient was quite restless. So we eventually got the patient fit enough for an anesthetic. Uh, so this is under general anesthesia. He'd also developed quite significant cataract. Uh, so this was the experience of trying to remove uh, silicon oil where you still have an intact posterior hyaloid. Uh, uh, it's not to be recommended. Uh, but one thing that the silicon oil did, presumably because obviously it induces some perioil inflammation, was it was a lot easier to find a tissue plane once you got rid of all the uh, loculated oil droplets. Uh, but this, so this was under general anesthesia. Again, very, very sick looking retina. Um, and it was still, still a real challenge to delaminate uh, this very, very this tissue, this very, very tough uh, fibrovascular complex of incredibly thin retina. Uh, sadly, there were one or two iatrogenic breaks and the, the patient did end up requiring oil tamponade, uh, but his retina remains attached and he's still under follow-up currently. Uh, but this is, I think, possibly my longest ever delamination. It's about three and a half hours. Uh, so I set aside an entire list for this. Um, but, uh, but again, I found the it was actually, I wanted slightly more rigid instruments uh, and to use something more familiar. So I didn't resort to the 25, uh, 27 gauge for this. Um, if you do, if you are using 27 gauge and you need to use oil, you can just take one of the trocars out and it quite happily inject oil uh, through a larger trocar. Uh, so it's, it's um, but again, I, I wasn't at that point on the learning curve with 27 gauge at this stage to use that. I, I went back to 25. ILM peel in some patients may be a helpful thing to do and it can prevent postoperative macular pucker. We can be sure that we've got all those vitreous remnants off. Um, we probably all had the odd case where you've thought you've done a really nice delamination and they come back and then there's further traction around the arcades, which is quite frustrating. Um, and also removing the ILM does remove the scaffold for subsequent membrane formation. It may reduce macular edema. Uh, the, the, it's still a bit questionable as to whether or not there's any significant effect on vision, but in, clearly in some cases, ILM peel can be helpful. And certainly anatomically, uh, it, the, the post-operative result can look a lot better when you've, when you've, you've removed all that, that membrane complex. How much laser? Um, how much laser should we do per-operatively? I think, as, as, as I said before, um, there was always that slight worry if we're very heavy with the laser, uh, particularly if there's areas of, of associated detachment as well, that we might introduce a little bit more traction, potentially a break. Um, clearly, it's better if they have significant laser preoperatively. And if we can employ more targeted treatment through preoperative uh, fluorescein angiogram, that's obviously better. Um, choice of tamponade and the worries really of using silicon oil uh, with the concerns over sometimes the oil impurities. And clearly with the, the poorer tamponade, we get that collection of growth factors uh, inferiorly where below the tamponade bubble. And obviously that's, that is a concern as well. So um, as, as, as other presenters have alluded to, it's obviously important to try and avoid oil uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, and hemostasis can be challenging, particularly if we haven't used anti-VEGF um, because obviously endocautery can be quite pro-inflammatory. Um, 
again, we, we can be limited, especially when, the, when they're actually retinal vessels uh, that, are, that are continuing to bleed. So vitreous hemorrhage, we've, we've mentioned, obviously, it's really important to try and get hemostasis and anti-VEGF really does help in that, that uh, reducing the early re-bleeding. Re, uh, um, the National Ophthalmology Database uh, data, 2016, quite a large series, did show that repeat vitrectomy uh, for these diabetics tended to have worse visual outcomes. Um, and it's really important, therefore, that obviously checking uh, the importance of checking for breaks uh, and making sure that if there are any posterior breaks, that we do remove all the traction. In those situations, the ILM peeling uh, would be important. Patients go obviously go on to get cataract. Um, patients also may get a postoperative IOP spike. I mean, we're thinking, uh, certainly as we try and streamline services of thinking about which patients we can perhaps see virtually uh, back. Uh, in the clinic, but these patients, um, particularly when they've had more complex surgery, particularly involving silicon oil, may get an early postoperative spike and you may want to see them sooner. Uh, if there's been a, a quite a heavy panretinal photocoagulation, it's possible to get ciliary body rotation uh, and that, that may be a reason for uh, getting a high pressure. So silicon oil plus heavy laser, quite often those patients can get quite a high pressure and may need to be watched more closely afterwards. We know that neovascular glaucoma, there is an increased risk after vitrectomy. And if you get re-detachment after that uh, surgery, then that, that risk goes up even further. So that's another thing we need to watch for. And obviously we need to look for the patients where there is already sadly combined regmatogenous tractional detachment, look for those giveaway signs. Uh, subretinal hemorrhage, if you've got subretinal hemorrhage, there's a very strong likelihood that there's a retinal break. Um, so just to, to finish off, uh, very important that with all the complexity of the management that we do think about the whole patient. Um, the, one of the patients I alluded to earlier, unfortunately he wasn't, he was not when we first saw him fit enough for a general anaesthetic, but he really wasn't a suitable candidate for local anaesthetic either. Um, unfortunately, sometimes you find these things out the hard way. Um, so obviously trying to make sure you give them the appropriate anaesthesia um, because obviously it can be a long operation and, and can be very difficult for them to lie still long enough. Small gauge vitrectomy, I think, is, a, is a, as we go to 27 gauge, um, the, the, the need for suturing afterwards, uh, as we know that with, with uh, diabetic vitrectomy, there's a slightly increased risk of endophthalmitis. And I think that, that there is increasing comfort knowing that if you've used 27 gauge, the, the need for resuturing is probably less. Um, and certainly, I think patient comfort wise afterwards, there's a definite, definite improvement. Um, ensuring that we've done adequate panorotinal photocoagulation at the time of vitrectomy. Again, we talked about optos fluorescein, wide, wide angled uh, fluorescein angiography, very, very helpful preoperatively if we've got a view. Uh, important to counsel the patient, particularly in terms of prognostic factors such as ischemia. The implications for this patient is that obviously the majority of our patients are quite young. Um, and I clinic liaison officer, we have a you know, support worker. We have two of them working in, in our eye, eye unit. Um, obviously very important. These patients have a number of, obviously have a number of other issues as well. Uh, and they need an awful lot of emotional uh, support. And then in many cases, sensory support as well. Uh, so it's just remembering that, that whole patient uh, at the end of the day. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Mark, for this really interesting presentation. And actually, this is the most challenging topic for uh, most vitreoretinal surgeon. And as I understand, you have recently tried to move from 25 to 27 gauge. Do you do, you do that for all cases or for selective cases? And my second question, when you do 27, do you use nearly the cutter as multi instrument like a scissor and so so yes so st I initially uh, for myself I found that the um, I think I found the increased flexibility of the instruments quite a shock initially uh, because there is a very big difference between that and the, and the 25 gauge which we which we'd all become accustomed to but uh, the more I'm using it I'm starting to use it now for epiretinal membrane peels macular holes um, and more and more because it, it, it's the, the eye is very stable. Once you get happy with the instrumentation and you're 
port placement, which I think is really, really important. Uh, keeping those, uh, the, your, your, both your ports at sort of three and nine o'clock as near as possible to three and nine o'clock. Um, it, it makes the surgery a lot easier. Uh, and I, yeah, absolutely. I'm tending to use that one instrument uh, throughout rather than chopping and changing between different instruments. Thank you. Any question from the audience? Uh, thank you, Dr. Um, Carson. Uh, it's very, very, very large and uh, well-defined uh, talk. <clears throat> uh, as you noticed, uh, small gauge vitrectomies and 27 gauge. I have really good experience for last uh, maybe more than five years. I use 27 gauge in macular surgery and and uh, in, uh, a step by step uh, diabetic case, but it's really difficult to work outside the major vascular arcade uh, with uh, this flexible instrument. But on the ma major vascular arcade, it really helps. And uh, now I can say that I can do a uh, membranectomy in not really complex case. I can do membranectomy with uh, seven gauge, 27 gauge probe without using uh, scissors and forceps. And it really helps, but uh, still I, uh, I select the case and I don't think that uh, I can do all complex case with 27 gauge. So yeah, when you uh, start to use, you get used to and you can enlarge your uh, indications, but never uh, all case. Yeah. I agree I, with you. Absolutely. Thank you. I heard, I heard that some of the companies are working on improving the rigidity of the instruments and my feeling that the new generation of the 27 gauge will be a bit more rigid, so giving yeah. you more access to more peripheral areas, hopefully in the future. Yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely true, but I think, um, as uh, Professor Absey was saying, I think the, the, it's really important as, as surgeons that we use what we're comfortable with and is, is safe in our hands. And it isn't a one size fits all. Um, you know, you do, you, you may hear people saying, well, I tend to use it for everything. It, it's, I, I think that, that, you know, th th there are times when you just going to resort back to something that you're, you're familiar with uh, and you know works well in your hands. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for uh, this interesting talk. And we finally conclude the session. And thanks for all speakers for joining us. Actually, we have speakers from the Far East, from Japan, and speakers from the US, and speakers from the middle. And fortunately, they all managed to join us uh, in the middle time zone. And Merry Christmas to everyone, and as they know that uh, the Christmas days are coming and looking forward to seeing you again in the future. And I'll give the hand to uh, Professor Mervet to conclude the first day of the annual meeting of South Carolina University. Oh, actually, Abdullah, it was a very interesting and a very successful meeting with all our distinguished guest speakers with their remarkable lectures and uh, excellent expertise. So you welcome again to our department and it will be a, a, a long story with you, all of you, for scientific collaboration, inshallah, in near future. Uh, thank you very much, Abdullah, our excellent moderator for the session. <laughs> it was a great task, actually. And I think, I hope all attendees benefit from this uh, discussion and scientific meeting and about uh, debatable issues uh, on written update, uh, many expertise here and uh, many still questions want to ask and want more and more research to answer our questions and worries. So thank you again. Uh, all are glad to have you in our uh, conference and repeat again and again, inshallah. Thank you very much all. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Bye. Happy New Year and happy Christmas. <laughs> yes. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.